Hey y'all. I had a really good day today with my mom and with the Sudden Impact team. Um, so I was feeling good and while I'm feeling good, I want to try and get the story out about when we told my mom about the kids passing away. Um, something a lot of people ask me to tell. I told the story on a TikTok live one time and I cried. <laughs> um, so I knew it was going to be like a cry fest, but I'm feeling hopeful today. Me and mom went eat lunch at Agave with the Sudden Impact team. And I had heard about the organization just from um, the crash happening and all of that. And I didn't realize how amazing of an organization was. They are truly making an impact. And I'm so honored to be a part of this wonderful organization soon. Um, I'm not sure what role I'll play. Um, I don't know any of the specifics yet. It was my first time meeting um, all the ladies and Thomas with the state police today. But I'm so excited to be working with Sudden Impact. Um, let's see. So, as most of you know, the crash happened on December 17th, 2021. And I want to pause here because I have been calling this an accident. It's just how I, you know, talk about car accidents in my vocabulary. And I've had a couple people on TikTok say, why do you call it an accident? It wasn't an accident. And I put a lot of thought into that and I said, you know what? It wasn't. I need to stop calling it an accident. Well, today when I met with the Sudden Impact ladies, Bridget corrected me. She said it was not an accident. It was a crash. What he did was not an accident. He chose to drink and drive. So you know what? I'm going to purposefully force that word out of my vocabulary. It was not an accident. Just wanted to get that out there because you know what? Everybody needs to do that. Um... What happened wasn't an accident and calling it an accident is giving him an out and it's making it okay. So I want to say one other thing. When we met today, Bridget brought up a good point and this was something I thought about in the past. Vehicular homicide, especially when it's from a drunk driver, is one of the most socially acceptable crimes. When someone is killed by a drunk driver, it's sad and, and, you know, it's horrible and all of this, but it's not treated as if someone was murdered. And they were murdered. They were murdered. It was not an accident. Um, I like true crime. And a couple of days ago, I was watching a case and, you know, this person was saying they weren't guilty and they went to trial. Then they appealed it. They went to trial again and just they spend all these money all this money and resources um on stuff like murder as they should but why isn't it the same case when someone is killed by a drunk driver they definitely should be treated the same um just wanted to throw that out there as well so my dad saw my mom after the crash when she got to the hospital and she was awake and she was just like what happened where am i so really just clueless and you know didn't even realize what happened, just completely out of it. And then I think that night they might have did something with her spleen. Saturday, I I don't know what went on. I did not go to the hospital Saturday. Um, I was doing stuff for the funeral. Um, I had to talk with the funeral home. They called me and let me know Lindy was at Karen Crow Funeral Home. That's where they brought her that night. And I had to get her to the funeral home where we were having the services. And I was just busy coordinating things that day okay so my mom doesn't know what happened to the kids she's asking my dad she's asking my brothers and I don't know what my dad was telling her but I do know when she asked Kyle he was like mama don't worry they in good hands which I just thought that was the sweetest little answer he could have gave her so on Sunday she was having her first major surgery on her leg um her right leg was broken in four places and her ankle was shattered. And that was also the leg where that, that had the open fracture. So she was having her surgery on Sunday. My dad was there. He had slept with her the night before. And me and my older brother, Ren, went to the hospital on Sunday. So we were waiting in the waiting room. 
um, Pastor Paul came, spent a lot of time with us, prayed with us, all of that. So when Pastor Paul was there, he was helping us make a plan on how we were going to tell my mom. Because throughout this whole process, I was categorizing all these little things as like little mountains. Um, like, so the first mountain to climb was telling my mom. The second mountain to climb was to start making the funeral plans. Third one was going to the funeral home to pick out a casket. I thought that was going to be horrible. You know, all these little things I needed to do. So the first thing was telling my mom. I mean, how do you tell someone that their three children have been killed? Um, especially her with these three kids. I just, unless y'all knew them, man, you just don't understand how much time she spent with these three. When we were growing up, we always had younger kids under us, so she couldn't devote her entire self to us. These three kids, every minute went to them. I mean, if she wasn't working, she was doing something for them. So, um, these kids are, they were just special. So, um, we were making a plan with Pastor Paul, how we were going to tell her. He said, how about we wait for all the kids to get here? We were still waiting on my brother to fly in. This was a Sunday. I think he was flying in on Monday. So we were going to wait till the next day, um, have all the kids in the room, have my dad in the room. He would have been in the room with us and we would have told her that was our plan. Things don't always go according to plan. So at this point, I still hadn't seen my mom. I hadn't talked to her. I hadn't seen her. She was completely out of it. So she had her surgery. The doctor came and got us and updated us, told us how well the surgery went and blah, blah, blah. He said she was doing so well. He didn't understand why she was still in ICU. So he said, she's sharp as a tack. I don't know how y'all are going to keep it from her much longer because she is asking. So we kind of knew that we were going to have to tell her soon, but we were still trying to stick to our plan. So um, after the surgery, they told us to stay in the waiting room and they would come get us when they got her back to her room. Well, it had been a good while and they still hadn't come got us. So my dad and my brother, Ren, decided to go walk to her ICU room and check on her, see if she had made it to the room. Turns out she did, and they just forgot to tell us. So as soon as my brother walked in, the first thing she said to him was, Ren, what's the kid's injuries? And Ren lost it. He was like, nope, like I cannot do this. Nope, I'm not telling her. And even though the doctor said he couldn't believe she was in ICU, to us, she looked terrible. Like, um, by the time I got in there, she she couldn't even move her head without her oxygen drop and her face was swollen. Every limb was swollen. I mean, she looked horrible. I mean, to me, she looked like an ICU patient, but I'm not a nurse. I'm not, you know, she looked terrible to me. So after my brother and my dad walked in and my mom immediately asked him, what are the kids injuries? He walked out and came get me in the waiting room and he was like, I can't do this. I can't do this. He was like, She's asking, but she's not well enough for us to tell her. We can't tell her that, you know, like none of us wanted to tell her. So I talked with the other pastor who was there at this time, Pastor Orm, and he was like, look, we have to do it. Um, the doctor told you he didn't think we could wait much longer. She's asking Ren, let's go clear it with her nurses, and then we're going to have to tell her. So we walked to the ICU and thank God, Lafayette General was so amazing. They were so awesome to us. They gave us like special privileges. Like we were able to have a good bit of people back there when really you only should have one visitor in ICU, but they just knew, you know, the extent of our tragedy. So we went to ICU, me, my dad, my brother, and two of the pastors and Two of my best friends were in the waiting room cheering me on because they knew what I was about to go through. I walked in like, y'all. So we met with our nurse and he was like, oh, she's fine. Like, she's there's, there's no more improvement that can happen that we would be waiting on for y'all to be able to tell her. Like, she's, she's coherent. Like, she's good. So I walked in and she immediately looked at me and I was so happy to see her um I was like mom hey 
She didn't want to hear that. She didn't want to, hey, look, no. She said, where's my babies? And I was like, mama, I was like, no. I was like, we worried about you right now. And she said, Katie, where are the kids? So I turned around, I started crying, and I looked at the pastor, and I said, I can't tell her. She don't, she's not well enough. Look at her. She, her oxygen's dropping. And he said, stop it. He said, the nurse said it was okay. Do it. And I am so thankful he was there to push me because I was chickening out. So I went around, I walked on the side of her, and I hugged her. And I said, Mama, I said, you in a bad wreck, huh? And she said, where are the kids? And then I I broke down crying and I said, they're going, Mama. And she said, all of them? And I said, I'm so sorry. I said, they didn't make it. And she said, Lindy? And I said, I'm sorry. And she said, brother, Cameron, and um, I'll put in a pic to show y'all what she looked like in the ICU, but I'm trying to tell y'all the story, but she was a lot worse off than I'm sound. I mean, she could barely talk. Like, even if she turned her head for a second, her oxygen would drop. So, like, she was, like, you know, like, barely awake, like, eyes barely open. Um. So then, like, she kept, she was like, no, 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 like panicking. So like, I feel like two or three minutes of that and her oxygen was dropping and her pulse was, it was just, I went get the nurse and I'm like, please come give her some anxiety medicine. Like she's not okay. So, um, they came give her some and within like a couple minutes it was working. I don't know what they gave her. Um, it was an injection. And she kind of started to doze off and she would doze off and then she would wake up and she would say, all of them, they all gone. And then she would kind of fall us, you know, like doze off again. And she would say, so they all gone. That was, that was one of the hardest moments of my life. Um, but now us talking she said i knew she said um nobody would give me an answer every time i asked so i knew they were gone but nobody confirmed it to me so really she vaguely even remembers me telling her um so that there's not one like specific traumatic moment where she found out she kind of just knew and then it was confirmed thought I would get through that without crying um when I shared the story with the sudden impact team today I, I really thought I wasn't gonna cry and then of course those two moments the moment where I identify Cameron and Christopher they get me every time but um I know a lot of people asked me to tell this story so I wanted to get on and let y'all know Talk to y'all later. Bye.